Good evening. Um, it is a, an honor and a, a joy to be here tonight. And as uh, Julie mentioned, I really feel the same that uh, coming to Schumacher College is uh, somehow like coming home. And I'd heard uh, about Schumacher College for many years, but it's actually the first time that I have the opportunity to come here. And uh, ever since we've arrived, which was only a very short time ago, we really felt a very sort of a, a well-known environment of like-minded, and not only like-minded, but like-hearted people uh, having uh, common values and, and striving in for a common goal. So uh, it's an honor and a, and a joy to be here and uh, sharing with you some of the experiments that we are trying to do in Bhutan. So, I called it the Bhutan experiment because uh, to me Bhutan is in a way like a lab for the world. It's uh, the first and the only country worldwide who is trying to implement a different uh, vision of what development and happiness and well-being and, uh, and economy could be and is if you try to give a other, another goal to what uh, development is about. So I've noticed in the past years a lot of uh, so-called alternative indicators flourishing everywhere in the world and that's good but uh, GNH is the only one that's been really implemented in a whole country so that's very interesting and don't get me wrong it's not an easy thing there's a lot of challenges and Bhutan is no way a perfect place and you know some people have this kind of romantic <coughs> fantasy of a Shangri-La where everything's perfect. It's not. And there, there are quite a few problems but uh, it's also facing these problems is a very interesting uh, element of the, of, the pro of the project. So when really a, a country is committed to trying to, to develop in a different way so what are the challenges that are coming back? And I'll mention a few of them. But before going to, into Bhutan specifically, I would like first to tell you, to start a little bit personally, is telling you a few things about myself and why I find myself, uh, you know, heading the Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan now. As uh, Julie mentioned, I worked for many years with the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is the part of the Red Crescent Red Cross movement that works in war zone and, and conflict areas. It means that uh, I've witnessed uh, a lot of wars and destruction and, and, you know, just think of all the places you have been, you've seen on TV, well, I've been there, like from Afghanistan to Darfur to Ivory Coast, to you name them, uh, that's where we're working. And so my experience of uh, the destructive nature of the current system is a very personal one, is a very direct one, is not only sort of uh, an idea, but it's a very immediate experience. And this led me to uh, feeling that when we came in with the Red Cross, it was always too late, because we always come in after the catastrophe has happened, after the war has broken out, when there are millions of, or hundreds of thousands of refugees, when you know, civil, civilian population are, are being slaughtered and then we, we, we come in and try to do something about it but it's always too late. So after doing that for a number of years I thought uh, it would be necessary to go on the prevention side and going to Bhutan for me was going on the prevention side. And before I, I'm, I'm uh, going to share with you some aspects of, of what Gross National Happiness is about, I would just not too long because you know we all are quite aware of the challenges of our time but just pinpoint three elements that to me uh, seem very important to bear in mind when we're speaking about uh, GNH and this is why do we need something like GNH I'm not saying we only need GNH but we need something like GNH uh, GNH standing for gross national happiness standing for a different way to lead development uh, worldwide. Well, the first, of course, huge challenge and probably most challenge is, uh, biggest challenge is the ecological crisis. And uh, this is a, a graph that is maybe well known to, to some of you, showing that actually uh, somewhere during the 70s we crossed 
the, the, the balancing moment where mankind is using as much as the earth is producing. And ever since the mid-70s, we've gone above that, meaning that now the earth needs about 18 months to produce what we as mankind are consuming in 12 months. So we need a planet and a half, but we only have one. And it doesn't take a very high level of mass training to calculate that using a planet and a half when we only have one won't last very long. And what I experienced very much firsthand being working with the International Committee of the Red Cross was that much of the conflicts are related with this uh, crisis over resources. So this is Iraq and uh, now if you look at the map of oil production and if you look at the map of world conflicts they pretty much overlap to a large extent they overlap but I think that this is only the beginning uh, I, I was quite a number of times in Darfur Darfur is West Sudan and as you probably heard about it there's been an ongoing conflict there for about more than 10 years yeah well over 10 years and in Darfur there's no oil and in Darfur there are no different religion there's only one religion everybody's Muslim so it's not a religious war and there's no oil so it's not a conflict over oil but it's a conflict over water and because of climate change you know there are two population living in Darfur there are uh, herdsmen having cattle and there are uh, agriculturists having fields and of course these two population need water and because of climate change the water has become less and so there always were some strives around you know oases and wells and little things but because of the climate change this has become very very serious and that was really what was the starting point of the Darfur conflict and uh, I realized being in Darfur and seeing also the violence and the intensity of the conflict that has been ongoing now and it's not even today has not really stopped that uh, oil wars are, are you know serious but the upcoming water wars they will have a, a an intensity a brutality and a that we can hardly uh, imagine because you can live without oil it's less comfortable but you can live without oil but you cannot at all live without water obviously so when it's going to be about water you know, it's going to be extremely serious and if we don't do something quite radical, quite soon, wars over water have already started and will become more and more. So that's one, one aspect that really very personally struck me and I thought we have to change the way we deal with natural resources. Because, and then shortly after that I heard an a, um, uh, a interview by by Peter Brabeck. Peter Brabeck is the CEO of Nestle. And uh, Peter Brabeck said, well, water is not a human right. Water is a commodity as any other commodity. So that's the second part, qu question, you know. This is, uh, we are facing an ethical economic crisis. I'm saying ethical economic crisis because of course there is an economic crisis and you know in Europe there's a lot of talk about euro crisis and look at Spain and Greece and, and so on and so forth but really the main economic crisis is, a, is an ethical crisis because it's a crisis of fair distribution of the resources so that's a you know that's a graph that shows you quite uh, clearly uh, world riches consume uh, the world which is 20% consume almost 80% of the world production and like in Bhutan for instance I'm giving quite a, often uh, talks in schools and if I show something like that it's a little bit abstract for, for you know youngsters or for kids to get so I, I tell them very simple okay imagine it's your birthday party and and your mom has cooked a, a, a cake a baked a cake and you have invited and your 10 kids, you have invited your friends, your 10 kids at the birthday party. Now imagine two of these kids are a bit bigger and stronger than the others, they're bullying the others around and they're taking eight 
you know, you have, the cake has been divided in ten, ten, ten parts because there's ten kids. So, but these two guys, they are guys most probably, <laughs> <laughs> they are taking eight, eight of the ten. And then the eight remaining, remaining children, most of them girls, I guess, have to share two parts of the cake. Well, that's what we're doing, right? So if you do it at home, right, any, and if you tell that in the class, all the children are really outraged and say, no, no I would never allow that, you know, not in my home, you know. And, and any, any child will have this natural feeling that it's not acceptable. And we've got to share with the other kids, right? But that's what we're doing, and we're not kids anymore. And we've been doing that for decades, you know. And so, so the, 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 the economic crisis is, is mainly an ethical crisis. It's, it's a, a crisis of unfair distribution. Yeah. And the consequences are, are very real, you know. They're, they're, they're really, and again, uh, when I was in Darfur, uh, I went to one of our feeding centers. You know, we have feeding centers where when the, you know, where there's a body mass index, body mass index, and when the children are under a certain number of the body mass index, they are entitled to go to a feeding center where they will receive so artificial feeding, and then the, fam the, the mother will re get special food for the children that is very nutritious, yeah, so to get the child back first, usually they have to do it through the the veins and then once the child has taken a little bit <coughs> weight then you will feed them with special kind of and so it was one of our uh, feeding center in, in, in Darfur and we were visiting there to assess the needs and th we asked the head nurse so so you know how everything was going and we were you know going around speaking with the mothers and the children and looking at the children and and uh, there was a mother there and she was coming again and the nurse said, but you've been here, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago and we gave you, we gave you, uh, you know, this uh, special uh, sort of uh, food and so your child should be now back to normal. And the mother said, yes, but you know, I have five other children at home. I cannot feed one and let the five others uh, go without food, you know, so I have to share it. So then it's not enough for the little one. So after that, uh, we changed the program and we said when a, a mother and a child come and one of the child is, is underweight, then we will feed all the children so that the mother is, is not in this horrible situation to have to decide whether she's going to f feed only one child or, and leave the four others without proper food or, you know, or whether she will distribute it and then the child who's already m malnourished and usually the youngest one uh, will again go down. So that was the, we renewed the program in this way. And then I came back at a, with, with a second mission some, some times later and went to the feeding center and asked, so, so how is it, is it now, did it solve the question, the, the, the problem? And, uh, and she said, no, not really. And I say, what not? And she said, well, the mother came again, or not necessarily this one, but a mother come again, and, and the, the, the baby was again underweight. And, and, and I said, so did we understand what's going on? And she said, well, you know, we really questioned the mother and she didn't want to admit it. And then, and then finally she admitted, you know, if the child is underweight, so if the body mass index goes down, then the whole family will be fed. If the child is back to normal, then they're not <coughs> entitled to get the food anymore. Then the whole family will starve again. You know? so, so just try to imagine the, uh, what it means for a mother you know, to have to starve her child in order to be able to feed her family. So that's the kind of, you know, that's what it means when we're speaking about, uh, you know, an, an, an ethical economic crisis. You know, that, that's the kind of situation we are creating in the world, right? And uh, so it's something very concrete. It's not sort of an abstraction, figures and graphs and statistics. It's people suffering horrible things because we are not able to distribute the resources in a slightly more just way. And the third crisis, and this crisis is actually hitting uh, the developed world more than the so-called developing world. It's what I call the spiritual crisis in the sense of, of a crisis of, for meaning. And, you know, in all the, in all the years I worked with the Red Cross 
we never had one million people dying in one year through armed conflicts or, or, or war. But we have one million people taking their own lives every year, most of them young people, and the majority of them coming from the developed world. So what kind of society are we crea creating where young people uh, d feel there's so little meaning in the society, in the world, in the life that is presented to them that they feel it's not really worthwhile continuing, right? So, you know, um, as a father and as a grandfather, uh, I, I'm sometimes a little bit ashamed, you know, thinking, you know, what have we done? Uh, how have we lived? so that uh, we, we, we young people come in a world where they, they don't see what they could do or what meaning life could have. And then we speak of youth unemployment, which is a really crazy kind of concept because look how much there is out there to be done, how much needs there are in the world. And then you have hundreds, thousands, millions of young people who have been told, no, we don't need you, we don't have a job for you, you're useless. That's the kind of message that they get. So then you're not really surprised that they, you know, don't see the meaning in life. But so, so what kind of, of a society is it that has created uh, uh, this kind of situation where we have to make special sort of advertising campaign to tell to, to the people, please, don't take your own life. You know, I mean, it's really, it's uh, unacceptable. It's really unacceptable. So that's why we need something else. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the uh, diagnosis, <laughs> Diagnos diagnostic. Yeah. So, interestingly enough, uh, you know, so I don't want to blame everything on GDP, but <laughs> GDP does have <laughs> quite a responsibility in this situation. And interestingly enough, the critic, the critic, the critic of <coughs> GDP, uh, actually. Uh, is, is not that new. And I would like to, you to listen to this uh, very interesting speech, uh, giving a very accurate, very accurate uh, uh, analysis of the problems of GDP. And this was done in 1968. <laughs> Too long. We seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community value in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product now is over $800 billion a year. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and it counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the fleet to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and sex knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. If the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play, it does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And it can tell us everything about America, except why we are proud that we are Americans. And shortly after that, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. So, uh, you know, uh, frankly, I don't know if there's a cause and effect, but it's a striking observation that you have this very powerful uh, criticism of, of the current, or uh, that was already current then, economic system, and then shortly after a while, af and 
that was during the presidential campaign, and you know his chances of being elected president of the United States were, were very high. And shortly after this speech, uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. So it goes to show that uh, uh, we're going against uh, strong forces there. You know when we're uh, challenging the current economic system and the GDP-led uh, economy. And I, I think really the analysis that, that, that uh, uh, Kennedy made, Robert Kennedy made, Bob Kennedy made, is really uh, still absolutely, you know, absolutely relevant. Because really what he, the way he shows the, that uh, a GDP kind of measurement of progress doesn't make any qualitative difference between the positive elements of, of growth and the negative elements of growth uh, are, are very clear and that most of the things that really make our human life human and worthwhile living just don't, they count for nothing in, in a G GDP measurement yeah? because if it's not connected with uh, selling and buying or something like that with monetary value it doesn't appear and yet we all know that the most precious things we have in our life are not bought and not sold. Yeah. Relationships, love, friendship, and all the rest of it. Yeah. So, four years later, uh, the king, in, on this picture is a bit <coughs> older, the fourth king of Bhutan, Jigme Singye Wanchuk, became <coughs> king at the age of 17. His father died, he became king. And uh, at this very early on, he tried to figure out, because Bhutan was just opening to the world, Bhutan had been completely closed until then, it was just opening to the world, and he, was, he had seen what had happened in the neighboring countries, India, China, Nepal, and so on, and he was trying to figure out how could we develop our country without paying this heavy price in terms of culture, nature, uh, community, and so on. And that's when he was uh, in, uh, it was in 1979, he was in Mumbai airport, Bombay at that time still, uh, and, and one, uh, one journalist, uh, Indian journalist, uh, a little bit like looking down on him, you know, Bhutan is such a tiny country, said, well, well anyway, what's the, what's the GNP of your country, you know? And that's where, uh, the king, the fourth king, famously said, "Gross national happiness is more important than gross national product." And so that was the first time this, the the, the word "gross national happiness" was was just formulated. And then, for quite a while, it, it was just sort of a, a general philosophical idea. We want to develop our country in such a way that we put the well-being and the happiness of our people in the center, rather than simply economic growth. But what did it mean in practice? For quite a long time, it was not very clear. So it took some decades uh, for this sort of more intu intuition. It was some, some kind of an intuition that the king had had. Very young man, you know, very young man. Uh, really became something more tangible, a policy and a, a way of governing the country. So I would like you to hear uh, the way uh, the, the Prime Minister of Bhutan describes in, in just a sh very sh few sentences what in his view GNH is about. So uh, uh, Jigme uh, Tinley, the Prime Minister of Bhutan, has just uh, resigned uh, two, uh, two weeks ago because now it's the second general election in Bhutan, so the whole government had to step down, now there's an interim government. At the end of the month it will be the first round of the election, general election, and uh, in July the second round uh, and uh, then, so we'll <coughs> see. If his party wins, he might be prime minister again. If not, then we might have another prime minister. So anyway, this is uh, what uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Jigme Tinley has to say about what GNH is in his view. GNH, or Gross National Happiness, is the philosophy that has guided Bhutan's uh, development process for about now, 40 years. It is based on the belief that development must serve a purpose. That development's role is not simply to promote continuous and limitless economic growth, which is what GDP 
or the conventional economic models tend to do. And that again, in, within a finite environment, within a finite world, there are bounds within which growth can take place. Natural, social, resources, and so forth. And so G and H is based on the belief that uh, development must be human-centered, and that its objective must be to create those conditions that will enable the human individual to achieve what is most important to him. And that happens to be happiness. <coughs> And then again, happiness, we believe, is a condition that can be attained when one is able to balance the needs of the body with those of the mind, the physical and the mental needs being balanced. And likewise, the uh, balance between the spiritual needs of the human individual and the material needs. And so, it is a human-centered, holistic, sustainable, and uh, inclusive development approach. <coughs> now, more and more people who are dissatisfied with the result of pursuing an economic development uh, that is no longer seen to be sustainable, they are seeing g and as an alternative development paradigm. And uh, until a few years ago, uh, you know, happiness didn't sound in the West like a serious <laughs> endeavor. And people smile, and you know, GNH, Bhutan, some kind of funny exotic thing happening in a little kingdom somewhere in the Himalayas. Not really something to be taken seriously uh, compared with the real world. And this has changed. Uh, you know, after 2008 and the financial crisis and uh, the gradual. Uh, uh, understanding that is really spreading around the world that uh, we are uh, uh, the development ha as it is had has been the way it has been going for the past decades is leading us into a, uh, a very difficult problematic place um, has begun to spread and uh, for instance the World Bank uh, you know World Bank not exactly uh, leftist uh, hippies or something like that, you know, uh, or alternative Schumacher people, kind of <laughs> <laughs> serious people, <laughs> real people, <laughs> World Bank. Okay, they've produced a, a report last November um, called Turn Down the Heat. Uh, you, you can find it on the World Bank webpage, Turn Down the Heat. And if you read this report, you will see that uh, the World Bank says, uh, if we don't change drastically uh, the way we, we envision development, then all the poverty alleviation efforts that we've done in the past decades will be reduced to nil. And agricultural production could decline by half in the coming, coming decades due to uh, climate change. So, so, you know, the situation is very serious and I, more and more people realize that it's very serious and suddenly uh, GNH is taken much more seriously than it used to be only a few years ago. And in uh, April 2012, so last April, uh, just over a month ago, a uh, year ago, uh, the government of Bhutan uh, con uh, convened a, a so-called high-level meeting at the UN in New York with uh, over 800 participants. Uh, opening speech was given by Ban Ki-moon, the, the, the um, Secretary General of UN, and uh, heads of states were there, ministers were there, uh, leading academics were there and uh, to discuss the necessity of a new development paradigm uh, focusing on happiness and well-being. So suddenly, or not suddenly, but gradually, there's a, a real movement uh, worldwide that realizes we need to find 
a, a viable alternative, a sustainable alternative, a fairer alternative to the uh, kind of development model we have been following it since uh, in the past decades. Uh, so this movement is growing and there's, you will find, if you look online, you will find a lot of different alternative indicators, uh, so-called, like uh, um, for instance, uh, Better Life Index by the OECD, Genuine Progress Indicator, Human Development Index, and, and many more. And they're all very interesting. But GNH is the only one that has been implemented on a country scale. Therefore, it's very interesting to study that. Not to say that you could simply copy-paste it and use it as such in Great Britain or in Europe or in the US, but there's a lot to be learned. Although some of it is very Bhutan-specific, there's a lot to be learned. So let us look a little bit closer uh, on what is GNH. But before we go into what is GNH, the first question is what is happiness? Because you know when the Prime Minister says, yeah, well, you know, we have to focus on what is most important and that happens to be happiness, many people will question that, challenge that. Why happiness? I mean, there's many things that are more important than happiness. So first of all, what happiness are we speaking about in this context? And again, uh, uh, Prime Minister Tinley gave a very interesting um, uh, definition actually that was during the 2009 um, uh, conference in, in, in Timpu, the so-called GNH and education, and I heard today, uh, today from Satish that he was actually there uh, when this speech was given by uh, Prime Minister Tinley, where Prime Minister Tinley says, we have now clearly distinguished, distinguished the happiness in GNH from the fleeting, pleasurable, feel-good mood so often associated with that term. We know that true abiding happiness cannot exist while others suffer. That's the first very important point. And comes only from serving others, second point. Living in harmony with nature, third point, and realizing our innate wisdom and the true and brilliant nature of our own mind, fourth point. So he has four elements that in the GNH uh, approach of what is happiness. The first one is Happiness is not a personal thing. Happiness is a collective thing. How can I be happy if you suffer? How can you be happy if I suffer? If we love each other? Yeah? And we should, I mean, feel, you know, if our uh, um, compassion uh, you know, in increases, then if any one of you suffers, it has an impact on me. Consciously or unconsciously, but it has an impact on me. So happiness is not only a personal thing that, ah, oh, I feel good. But it's, you know, how do we share that? How is it collectively? And then, and interestingly, there's a lot of so-called happiness research has been done now. And happiness research clearly shows that, for instance, one of the biggest source of happiness, long-lasting happiness, is altruism, giving. Yeah, they, you, you can find online lots of, if you type happiness research, you will find a lot of, of, of findings, very interesting findings, where you see that all the, and that's transcultural. It's not only in this or that society. It's, a, it's like a human quality. Yeah? If, you, if you, for instance, there was this experiment, people were given randomly on the street a, a certain amount of money, $50, $100, something <coughs> like that. And one group was said, was given this money with just one rule. You can do whatever you want for, with it, but only for yourself. Buy whatever you want. And the other group was, uh, you can do whatever you want, but for someone else. And then they, they followed these two groups. You know? And it appeared very clearly that those who were given the indication spend it for someone else had a much more long-lasting satisfaction than those, I mean, you know, you buy a new thing, and you know how it is. You buy it, yeah, you're quite satisfied for a short time, but not very long. And then the thing that you bought becomes boring very rapidly. While something you do for others, it's something else, you know, it's a quality that remains. So anyway, that, that's the serving others. Then living in harmony with nature, which is a fundamental human need, although you wouldn't think when you see big cities, but, you know, when you ask people, so, what is for you a source of uh, joy or of uh, peace or of energy? Eight out of ten will tell you nature. You know, as one of the leading things that, you know, if, if I go out in nature then I feel better, I feel more peaceful, I feel more whatever, yeah? So nature, living in harmony with nature is a very uh, deep uh, human, human uh, sort of need. And, and then 
you know, this is more maybe uh, formulated in Buddhist terms, but I think it's pretty universal. It's really uh, unfolding our deepest or our highest potential. Yeah. So that actually what really brings us ultimately satisfaction and real happiness is that when we have the feeling we can live a meaningful life and we can unfold our highest potential yeah. and not just, you know, earn money or this and that. So, so this... Uh, do, yeah. Realizing our innate wisdom and the true and brilliant nature of our own mind. And uh, after this uh, um, April 2nd meeting, uh, the UN decided that uh, 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 March 20 would be International Happiness Day. I don't know if you have celebrated Day of Happiness on last March 20. If not, then next March 20, celebrate it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we did so uh, in, in Bhutan, several places, and uh, I, I went... Uh, uh, with actually with my wife and uh, with one of my co with some of my colleagues, we went in in Bumtang, which is in central Bhutan, and we went to a little primary school, and we organized a happiness festival for them, with you know uh, cultural events and uh, and uh, a painting and and meditation, and they each class um, uh, was encouraged to nominate their happiness hero. It was one student of the class that was the one who was giving or bringing the most happiness to the other children. So each class then celebrated their happiness hero. So it was a very nice uh, celebration. And then we asked the children to draw what was happiness for them. So these are just, we got many drawings, but the, these were some. Happiness is loving, sharing, caring, and traveling. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, they were like, what, 10, 12 years old, something like that. Yeah? So very sweet and with nice, you know, and, so there's a car here, you know, <laughs> for traveling, and so you know, the family sitting together, and so on, yeah, you know, and the, uh, the, with the pond, nature, and playing, and so. And we asked, we asked another, and another group uh, came with feeling happiness, uh, and so it's very sweet because that's the picture of the king, and so the, the children say happy birthday to the king. <laughs> so, so, so when you ask children what is happiness, you know, what comes out is sort of very natural things and we didn't have a, a, a single child who told us happiness is a, a, a new iPhone or something like that, you know, it just didn't come, you know, it was really human-centered, uh, yeah. And uh, just to end this little uh, reflection on what is happiness, a, a quote by Shantideva who was a great uh, Buddhist philosopher, uh, Indian philosopher in the, uh, I think, 8th century or something like that, saying that all the suffering in the world comes from seeking pleasure for oneself. All the happiness in the world comes from seeking happiness for others. So pretty much the same idea uh, in, the, in, in the words of Shantideva. So now let us look a little bit more closely into GNH as such. Uh, the first thing is uh, that obviously GNH in Bhutan does have a cultural roots. Right? But I, I do think at the same time that uh, most of it is uh, quite universal, although the specific way in which it's implemented in Bhutan is based on Bhutanese culture. So this is a so-called mandala. A mandala is a, uh, a symbolic representation both of the human mind and of the universe. The human mind being like the microcosm of the universe being the macrocosm. And a mandala always has four doors. And then these four doors are like the four doors into the kingdom of uh, the inner kingdom, and then depending on what is in the center, it depends what kind of meditation, you know, you visualize that when you meditate. And in this case, this symbolizes compassion. Uh, th this eight is a, is, a, is a mala, is something like that. You see, it's, it's a prayer bead in, put like that. And this is the attribute of Chenrezi uh, Avalokiteshvara, the, the Bodhisattva Sattva of compassion. So this is the mandala of compassion. But every mandala, no matter what is then the purpose of the meditation, has four doors. And these four doors are connected with four basic attributes, or called the immeasurable minds, which is loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Loving kindness being the first door. Loving kindness being the will to make other people happy. And Compassion is the will to alleviate other people's suffering. And joy, because if you are practicing spiritually, then you become joyous. 
if you are not becoming joyous, maybe your practice needs to be revised. <laughs> spiritual practice should bring joy. <laughs> yeah. So if you're a spiritual practitioner, maybe you should revise the way you meditate. <laughs> you <should. laughs> so joy and equanimity. Which is, and equanimity is seen in two ways. One is a certain inner stability uh, facing the, the challenges of life. And the other side is equanimity is described as uh, the mother loving all her children equally, or the son lighting all beings equally. So it's non discrimination. Yeah, it's non discrimination. So these four doors are sort of uh, interesting because then you realize that. Uh, GNH has four pillars, you know, and so the first, well, I, this is not a specific order because the doors, they are like four around. So one is sustainable and equitable social economic development. So of course economic development is important, but it should be equitable. So it means uh, uh, in the sense of uh, upeksha, uh, uh, equanimity, yeah? the distribution should be fair in space and in time, so that's uh, sustainable. Because it's not enough to share it in a fair way for those who are alive. We have to think of the generations to come. So right now, it's not fair and it's not sustainable. It means it, in space it's not fair. Some are consuming far too much and others have far too little. And it's completely taking no consideration whatsoever our children, our children's children, and their children. Because if we continue like that, what earth would they have, right? So, so economic development is important, but it has to have these two qualities of being fair for those who are here now, and it has to be sustainable for those who will come after us. So that's uh, connected with equanimity, upeksha. Uh, uh, yeah. Then, uh, preservation of the environment and resilience of the environment, uh, ecology, uh, na nature. And uh, from a Buddhist perspective, it's, uh, it's uh, something a little bit different than the way ecology is oftentimes thought of, about in the, in the West. And, and especially in Bhutan, this is very strong because A, uh, in, in Buddhism we always say, may all beings be happy, not all the people be happy, all beings. That includes all living beings or all sentient beings. So the preservation of environment is also for all beings, not only for us. I mean, even if we are completely egoistic, human-centered people, you know, like uh, how do you call that? Uh, centered on our own species. Even there, it doesn't make sense to destroy our environment <laughs> because we will suffer from it. But if we think a bit broadly, more broadly, it's also not only for us. It's also for the rest of the you know, uh, of all the beings. Uh, and, and the second dimension that is very strong in Bhutan is the awareness of the sacredness of nature as such, nature spirits, you know, like spirits of the water, of the mountains, of the trees. And this, is, this consciousness is still very, very present and very alive in Bhutan. It's not, and you know, Bhutan's never been colonized, so never, n n nobody has ever told them this is superst superstition or this is backward or something like that. So they're very at ease with that, uh, you know, that, that uh, they feel, yes, of course, you know, like there's uh, spirits in the water, in the trees, in the rocks, in the mountains. For instance, you're not allowed to do mountain climbing in, in Bhutan. I mean, you can walk, you can hike, but you cannot do like, you know, going up to the high summits because this is abodes of the gods and you should not disturb them. You know, and when you look at Everest Base Camp, you know, which has become like a huge trash kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> so you say, wow, how wise were they not to allow, like John Molari, the highest mountain in Bhutan, is the highest mountain in the world that has never been climbed. You know? uh, because this is for the gods. It's, you, you have nothing to look for up there yeah, as human beings. So this kind of feeling that nature is, uh, is sacred. So, you know, ecology is not only for our own sake. It's also for the nature, the sake of nature itself because it's sacred, with a deep ex inner feeling of uh, interdependence, uh, which is like the fundamental teaching of, of Buddhism, interdependence. Yeah. And the third one is preservation and promotion of culture. And this is related with the element of joy. Of course, you, theoretically, you could live with a, without art. You could. 
could survive without music, without painting, without dancing, without you could. But what a sad life it would be. I mean, horrible. You know? So culture is what really brings joy and you know and, and sense of community and all these very important things for the for our uh, well-being and happiness. So the, uh, culture is is not only like to preserve something from the past, but it's really to create an environment where people can flourish. And and lastly, of course, good governance, uh, <coughs> because the the, the the government and the, uh, you know has a, a strong responsibility and. Uh, uh, for instance, Bhutan is, uh, is the country where the Anti-Corruption Commission is probably the most powerful worldwide. Uh, just to give you an example, just before Christmas in December, the, the, the Speaker of the House and the Home Minister, so number two and number three of the government, very powerful man, uh, uh, where uh, you know, the Anti-Corruption Commission made a, an inquiry against them, not for something they had done in, now that they're in power, but uh, six years ago when they were governor, of a province, there were they, there was some accusation that they the when they distributed land was not really fair, and six years later the anti-corruption commission has got hold of, of these documents and now they are, they have been indicted, and it's a lady who's the head of the anti-corruption commission and she's a very courageous and uh, powerful lady and politicians are all very afraid of her, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that's the kind of. A country, you know, I'm, I, you know, as it was said before, we also a lot of in Vietnam, and I wouldn't compare what prob huge problem corruption has become in Vietnam. And when I see the way in Bhutan, really, this courage to say, okay, it doesn't matter if you're number two and three of government, if you do something that is not really <coughs> right, then you will have to, you know, to pay for it, or you, have, you will have to, you will be held accountable. So that's an example of good governance. So the, this is the, the wheel of the nine domains of GNH. Definitely we cannot go into it tonight, because, uh, but just to tell you that, uh, so we have first GNH is a philosophy, a vision, values. Then it is four pillars that are guiding the development process of Bhutan, and then it's an index. <laughs> so it's a way to measure development, and the index is uh, made of nine domains that are being measured. The first one is psychological well-being. The second one is health. The third one is time use. So time use is a very interesting indicator because the way you use any social change will change the way people use their time. So it's a very powerful indicator, time use, to, to monitor the change in a society. Then there is education cultural diversity and resilience, good governance, community vitality, ecological diversity and resilience, and living standards. So, so these are the nine domains that are measured, and at the same time there are sub-domains and then indicators that are used for the survey. Just want to give you one or two practical examples what it means in the way <coughs> policy making. Two aspects. One is Every two years, there's a survey made all over Bhutan to, to see in, all, the of, in this field, all of these nine fields what are the ones that are strong and which one are the ones that are weak, where, according to region, age group, gender, and so on and so forth. And this allows the, 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 the government to allocate resources in an intelligent way. The resources are limited. It's a small country. It's a poor country. Resources are limited. Therefore, one sh has to allocate resource in a very efficient way. And this enables to allocate resource in an efficient way. And you also realize that certain things have nothing to do with money. For instance, time use or uh, psychological well-being is not about throwing more money at it. Yeah. And so the consequence is that all the projects have been s are screened through a GNH tool. An example, a couple of years ago, uh, the government of Bhutan thought maybe they should join WTO, World Trade Organization. And they, the, the project was presented to the government by the uh, foreign minister and the minister, ministry of finance. They wanted to join for obvious reason. Uh, foreign <coughs> ministry and uh, ministry of finance, they are interested to get into WTO. And they had a first round of discussion in the cabinet, 25 participants, and 19 were for it and five against it. And then they said, okay, let's screen the WTO rules with the nine domains and indicators. So 
they realize, for instance, okay, from the point of view of uh, living standards, very positive. It will rise the living standard. From the point of view of health, it might be good because we might get some support and this and that. But from the point of view of time use, very negative. Psychological well-being, very negative. Ec ecological diversity, very negative. Community vitality, very negative. So they didn't join WTO. You see, so because they are looking not only at one indicator, will it bring money, but at all the effects it will have on the population. So that's the idea of a, a GNH screening tool that for whom living standard and income is only one of nine rather than being the one and only holy grail, you know, money, money, money. It's only one of nine and in many cases not the most important one. Because for instance you will see that in the capital Timpu the living standard is much higher than in the countryside but most of the other indicators are lower. Less community vitality, less time for family and friends and leisure uh, and, and you know so, so then you think okay money is more there but all the rest is less so is that where we want to go right so this is just an example um, so one of the big question is you know where do we want to go as a society and uh, when I left Timpu, I had a stopover in uh, Bangkok airport and in Bangkok airport I was standing in there and then I took my camera and I did like this and this is one, one of ten pictures that I took and all were like that. It was like Hermes and then it was uh, Omega and then it was Rolex and then it was whatever, you know, like this. You know. And then I thought to myself, you know, in, 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 a, sh in a shop like that, like, let me tell you something else. There was a, there was a uh, not exactly a survey, but it was more like an inquiry that has been done. You also find it in the internet of what does an average family eat a week? And you find they've done it in 40 countries. And we, each time you have the picture of the family with a table and they've piled up what they're eating in one week and how much it costs. Right? And so the highest was Germany, 360 pounds a week for a four people family and with lots of food I mean they were big and strong they probably <laughs> needed to eat quite a lot <laughs> a lot of packaged food and, and sausage and this and that 360 <laughs> and the cheapest was a Bhutanese family five people 3.2 pounds a week <laughs> and absolutely no packaging just chili and you know and chili and chili <laughs> and chili and rice and chili and rice and <laughs> buckwheat <laughs> anyway okay 3.2 pound versus 360 pounds, right? So, you know, and then I'm standing in Bangkok airport just coming from Bhutan, you know, and, and looking and turning around like that and saying, wow, I mean, how many Bhutanese family could you feed for how many years <laughs> with simply what is in there, you know, one shawl, like 500 pounds or something. <laughs> anyway, consumerism. And the question is, you know, what are we trying to compensate through consumption? Right? And does it work? <laughs> you know, does it work? <laughs> Apparently not, because otherwise we could stop consuming if it worked, right? If, we, if actually my new computer would bring me happiness, then I would, that would be it. I would have one computer. But every two years I need to buy a new one, yeah. and, and so on and so forth. So, so consumerism is a kind of an addiction, right? An addiction is always a symptom that there is a, a very strong lack, uh, something is missing. So, consumerism cannot be transformed simply by um, uh, structural elements. It has to be a, a change in mindset. So this was a, the first program we did in, in Bhutan uh, and it was called Mindfulness is a Source of Happiness and uh, we had in four days almost 500 young people basically doing mindfulness program, meditation, and thinking about what brings them happiness and so on. And so you can see all the Bhutanese kids, they are dressed in traditional clothes. Yeah? You don't see, and not any one of them has a jeans or a t-shirt, they're all in traditional clothes. Those who are not in traditional clothes, they're foreigners. <laughs> 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 and uh, so th that was a very interesting experience to see how, you know, even young people, and they're in Timpu, so they're exposed to Western culture, they're exposed to consumerism, but actually how very easily they could 
let that go and you know really come back to themselves and, and really share with us that oh this is really what brings happiness and that's another picture that was taken on this happiness day in uh, in Bumtang so I ended the day with a meditation with all the kids all the teachers and all the parents and uh, so you see when I'm in Bhutan I'm wearing Bhutanese clothes I'm sitting in the middle yeah, I'm not wearing suits <laughs> and, uh, so you see the landscape this is where the GNH center will be uh, located. So uh, what I'm trying to say with that is that uh, there's really two, two sides to it. One is a uh, political uh, uh, development paradigm, structural questions, systemic question, and the other one is a question of transforming the mind. You know? And that happens primarily through education. You know? So that, that we can educate the children and the young people to find in themselves this kind of values and, and satisfaction, contentment, you know, content, deep contentment, uh, linked with serving others, being in harmony with nature, finding their true selves, so that they don't need to compensate by buying stuff that will anyway never really bring long-lasting satisfaction. So, uh, this leads me to say, to, to conclude a few words about the Ginech Center, uh, and, and really our, our core view is how to connect inner transformation and social change. So we are totally convinced that we cannot bring any long-lasting social change if it's not really rooted in deep inner work, inner transformation, inner consciousness work, inner path. But inner work alone is not enough because our society, our world in a situation that I don't think that it will be enough if we retire in a monastery and meditate and hope that the good vibration or the good positive energy will, will, will solve the problem. We also need to really engage socially and, and contribute actively to the transformation of uh, structures and systems so that they become more fair, more sustainable, more just, more human and so that's really our core belief that inner transformation and social change and the way we do it is uh, by doing three things one is understanding but really wisdom not only information but real understanding insight and this needs to open the mind you know, really open the mind to a new dimension and the second is creating an environment where people can have a first-hand experience what would a GNH society look like so we are trying to create this kind of environment like a prototype so people can get a, an experience. Otherwise it's very theoretical, it's abstract. GNH, indicators, statistics, this and that. But people need to experience it with the heart. So how do we open the heart for one another so that you know, things like uh, compassion, empathy, care for one another becomes an, a lived experience rather than a moral sort of, you know, you should or something like that. And then we have to go into action. So implementing GNH, so open will, so that we really take hold of our will, of our action, of our limbs. So it's pretty much the head, heart and hand that uh, also is promoted in Schumacher College. And I said we're, I think, very, we have very similar views on that. But for us, these are really the three dimensions that always have to belong together one or two of them alone is not sufficient. It has to go all the way down to very practical projects that will actually transform something. At any level of the system, you know, not everybody is going to change big things, but if you even change something in your family, or you change something in your school, or your organization, or in your, that's already a big change. You know? But it has to go all the way to action. So this is uh, the master plan. So uh, we have 46 acres of beautiful land in Bumtang, central Bhutan. And this is like the river that is flowing. We will have also, we're uh, looking at uh, completely 100% renewable independent energy with floating turbines and solar and biomass and so on. And this is a, we have a six, six phase construction plan that is beginning uh, this year. And we will have a, uh, work camp for young people uh, to start preparing the land in September. And uh, so this is the kind of uh, vision that we have. Uh, it's a village, small houses, and each house lives as a community with like, you know, like house parents 
taking care of the house and each house has a, a theme like here it's textile cooking and another house will be medicinal plants or you know, it has a theme so that uh, beyond the fact that you're joining a course you choose a theme that you're interested in so at the end of the course in, on top of the course you have learned how to weave maybe or how to cook or how to you know so theme houses and then uh, general courses and what we want to do is have the best of traditional architecture Bhutanese which is uh, rammed earth mud houses with wooden frames beautiful woodwork in, in Bhutan and at the same time the best of gr the most advanced green technology so you know trying to have the best of both worlds so finally just for the pleasure of the eyes <laughs> tiger's nest <laughs> the very famous uh, uh, sacred place uh, in Bhutan where Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava uh, meditated in a cave for many for a long time and he's the one who brought Buddhism to Tibet uh, this is uh, just an amazing monastery um, just on a very uh, a very high cliff and a very last slide uh, uh, calligraphy by my teacher Thich Nhat Han. Uh, there is no way to happiness happiness is the way so uh, and I think that's really important because it's not like somewhere in the distant future once we will get there mm -hmm. we can start right here and now <coughs> and it's available right here and now mm -hmm. thank you